Hi, Matt here. So this week's video was originally going to be a budget review, where I actually take a look at a budget and uh, kind of give my overall impression of it, maybe make some you know suggestions, give my little two cents into the overall uh, uh, into the overall budget. But as I was doing some research into this topic, specifically like with keywords and everything, I came across this uh, video here by uh, CNBC on why budgets are a waste of time. I think it's a pretty good also indicator of the like to dislike ratio over here uh, is the quality of this video. But when I saw this, I, I had to respond to it. So next week will be a budget review. Um, but this week, I just want to kind of go over a few points that were made in this video because um, they really kind of got me a little bit. So uh, anyways, let's uh, do a full screen on this. And let's get going. I'm Kathleen Elkin, Senior Money Reporter at CNBC Make It. And over the years, I've done a lot of experiments to see how I can make, spend, and save my money differently. From going cash only, to quitting my gym membership, to giving up restaurants. But there's one thing I simply refuse to do, and you shouldn't waste your time on it either. It's the B word, budgeting. Okay, um, first off, who are these experts? <laughs> uh, I'm really curious as to who these folks are and where they're coming up with this idea that, um, that budgets are, are a waste of time. I. I'm, and also, in addition to that, what are these experts? What are their net? What's their net worth? I mean, are they millionaires? And if so, how did they get to that millionaire status without doing some kind of budgeting or planning? Um, in fact, look, see this. This is basically a giant study on millionaires. And if I was to look in here, uh, let's see here. Even on page nine. Oh, right here. Portrait of a Millionaire on page eight. And then it goes... This is where they list a bunch of characteristics of millionaires. Most of our wives are planners and meticulous budgeters. Most of us will tell you that our wives are a lot more conservative with money than we are. Okay. And then again, if we were to look under... Let's see... Playing great defense. They're talking about defense and, and the way millionaires play defense. Defense would be like budgeting and planning. Offense would be like your income strategies. So it says here, millionaires play both quality offense and quality defense. And quite often their great defense helps them outscore, out accumulate those who out earn or have superior offenses. Right here. The foundation stone of wealth accumulation is defense, and this defense should be anchored by budgeting and planning. It then goes on to discuss a typical husband and wife millionaire couple. They calls them uh, Mr. and Mrs. Jane Rule. And it says here, you know, why are Mr. and Mrs. Rule millionaires today? Because Mrs. Rule plays tremendous defense is responsible for budgeting and spending for both her household and their business. Is anyone in, in your household responsible for budgeting? All too often, people allow their income to define their budgets. When we tell our audiences about budgeting and planning habits of the affluence or the wealthy, someone always asks the predictable question, why would someone who is a millionaire need to budget? Our answer is always the same. They became millionaires by budgeting and controlling expenses and they maintain their affluent status the same way. These are the experts that I'm looking at because these have actually, these are folks that have actually made it. I don't know who these experts are, but if they're saying budgets are not correct, I'm really more inclined to agree with the millionaires that actually say that they do budget. So, moving on. I found that it's possible preferable even, to live my life without using a strict budget. And it's super free. So how common are these budgets anyway? Here's what personal finance expert Ramit Sadie has to say. I am so sick of people telling you to keep a budget. 
I know half the people who are out there telling you this advice. They don't even keep a budget themselves. I keep a budget. And a lot of the successful, wealthy people that I know keep a budget. Um, I'm not exactly sure who he's referring to. And the thing is, is I like, I like Ramit. He has a lot of really good uh, advice. And I've seen him around the internet every now and then. But this is just one thing I just don't agree with. Let's get real. Hold your horses, Ramit. I think we gotta back up a little. So what exactly is a budget? A budget lays out your spending priorities. It divides up how you're going to spend your money between mandatory things like bills and discretionary things like coffee. Okay, so technically she's right. Yes, that's what a budget does do. But I think this is where the video really kind of, it, it really misrepresents what's really happening and why I think they're saying that budgets, because later on in the video they will say that budgets, they're not fun, they're, they're boring, they're uh, disappointing, they're, uh, they're stress-inducing. Yes, on the surface, they are a way of taking care of your mandatory and discretionary expenses. But that's like saying that a car is a bunch of metal and an engine and wheels and it just goes back and forth. Technically, yeah, that is what it does, but its purpose is to get you from point A to point B, physically. Just like a budget's purpose is to get you from point A to point B financially. Budgets don't exist in a vacuum. They have to be connected to some goal somewhere. And until someone actually attaches a, a real goal, like whatever it is, whether they wanna raise their net worth by $20,000, whether they want to uh, you know, get, become debt free, whether they want to save up for a house, whether they want to increase their uh, savings rate by you know, 10% or whatever it is. The budget is the cornerstone. It's, it's the CPU of your entire financial system. So to look at it as just this thing that you, you, know, you use to pay your bills is to seriously undercut the whole purpose of the budget. And I think, and as this video goes on, I'm going to make more points on that, but that seems to be the real issue that I have with their whole thesis. And it often makes us feel bad about our spending, but maybe we shouldn't feel bad. Take Fallon, for instance. She's a dancer slash waitress who fits coffee into her monthly spending and still lives comfortably in New York City. Coffee is my big splurge. I usually probably spend $100 a month at Starbucks. Oh, yeah. A hundred dollars a month a Starbucks. Uh, okay, a hundred bucks a month. Over a course of a year, that's twelve hundred dollars a year. Assuming, I mean, I. That is literally twelve hundred dollars you are pissing away every year. I. Uh, yeah. Self-made millionaire and master side hustler Grant Sabatier agrees. I've always hated budgets. I never wanted to do that type of deep dive. And I also think they reinforce a scarcity mindset. The entire personal finance industry tells you that you need to cut out your latte or that glass of wine. But it's often those small things that make us the happiest. Okay. Two things. On one half of this, I, I kind of agree with him. As far as the scarcity mindset is concerned, so here's the thing. Not doing a budget is what creates the scarcity mindset. I completely disagree with him. It's not doing the budget that will actually do that. So if you don't do a budget, you could end up in, imagine this scenario. You have a week before your next paycheck and you have 20 bucks left over. You can either choose to get groceries or food or gas for your car. That's an either or mindset. And when you're looking at either or, that creates the scarcity mindset because you only have 20 bucks and it can go into one or the other. As opposed to an abundant mindset, which is where instead of using the phrase either or, you're using the word and. So it's not, well, do I go groceries or gas? It's I can do groceries 
and gas because I budgeted and I planned and I knew how much I was going to need for each of those categories at the beginning of the month. So as far as this, this idea that creates a scarcity mindset, no, I completely disagree. Creating a budget creates an abundance mindset. And additionally, I have worked with people who have done, who were, we worked with budgets and everything. And it's only after they have done a budget and they've gone through say the last three to four months worth of expenses, that that's when they realize, holy crap, all this money has been coming out and I've been overspending on gas, on food, on, on you know, going out to the, you know, going out with my friends or going out to sports events or going out drinking or something like that or whatever it is. They find out all these holes in their budget and once they fill them up, all of a sudden they have all this extra money. <laughs> and so that's what creates an abundance mindset where you have more at the end and you start using the word and instead of either or. So I don't agree with them on this one. Now, on the other hand, a part of, I, I do agree that there are the little things that kind of do give us joy and pleasure throughout life. And certain things like, you know, cutting out, you know, lattes and, and cutting out, you know, th these tiny little things aren't really going to make a whole hill of beans of a difference in the long run. Um, however, that being said, there's a very slippery, dangerous slope where, because that kind of thinking of, ah, it's okay to go ahead and spend an extra five, 10 bucks here or there can get you in a position where you have thousands of dollars of debt, you don't have your savings, you don't have enough saved up for retirement. That can definitely lead to a very dangerous route. The main things are um, food, housing, and transportation. If you can cut on those, but again, you need a plan for that, and that's what a budget is. So, five or ten or twenty or even a hundred dollars here or there, it's not going to make or break you. Let's see what our friends in New York City spend their money on: Oops. restaurants and alcohol. I buy five dollars worth of Starbucks every day, and like someone really made me feel bad by calculating it up for the whole year, and I think it was twelve hundred dollars. But like at this point, I don't care. I need my energy. I five dollars a day. That's okay. Thirty days. It's one hundred and fifty bucks a month times twelve. That's eighteen hundred bucks a year. Okay, and let's say you don't. So if you don't do weekends, let's say because he doesn't get coffee on weekends, that that would be around yeah twelve hundred. So between twelve hundred to eighteen hundred dollars a year on coffee. How do you? Okay. 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 All right. Okay. Look, I'll be honest. Be truthful. It's not really. It's not that he's spending a hundred dollars a month on the coffee. That's really what gets to me. Because to be totally honest, it's okay to. Not. I'm not gonna say it's okay. I, I don't agree with that. I don't think that it's a good idea to do that. I think there's much better things that you could be putting that $100 towards. Maybe it's a savings, maybe it's if he has any debt, if he has an emergency fund that he doesn't have funded up, if he's saving up for a house, okay? I agree that there are much better things that he should be putting that money towards. However, I'm also, like, I, like that other guy said before, I'm not all against this idea of cutting out all of these tiny little luxuries that you might enjoy throughout your life. So is there a way of doing both? And there is. But it doesn't include excluding a budget. Okay, uh, let me show you down below. So I'm not really concerned primarily with the, you know, the fact that someone wants to spend $100 a month on coffee. It's, it's really where, I mean, that's their choice. It's, but really, where is that money coming from? What is the income source from that? If you're using money that you're using from your job, then that's money that you're exchanging your time for, and you can never get that time back. Whereas if you had some kind of a giant asset, okay, so um, from the net worth equation, oops, from the net worth equation, you know, A minus L, let's just assume we're debt free, because that's the only real way to do this. If this asset right here that, you know, we can grow an asset, which in turn will grow our net worth. If we have an asset that we could use that would provide income, and we decide to tap into that, 
you want to use that to for all that discretionary spending. You want to go out to coffee and then and, and the games and the and to all this other kind of whatever else you want to do. You want to go out for drinks and stuff like that. Doing it that way because this thing is just going to constantly keep if whatever the asset is. It's, let's say for example you're using a uh, some kind of a dividend paying uh, fund or a group of funds. So in that case, the, the way it would work is. We want to know, okay, what asset value, A, and let's say your dividend payouts are right around 4%. 4% is a pretty decent dividend yield. What asset value of 4% will give you, and let's see, we had $100 a month. All right, let's just take this for example. And you have 12 months in a year. All right, so that gives us, obviously, $1,200 per year. So we take that down here, 1200 right? So, and this is an annual percent yield, and this is a per year, so we're, our time frame is, is the same. So for A, A equals 1200 divided by four, all right, let's go, 30 grand, plus or minus. So if you had $30,000 saved up in some kind of an investment account that basically yielded around 4, 000, uh, about 4%, roughly every year you would get $1,200, which divided out is your $100 a month for your coffee. And this thing will continually just poop out dividends whether you're involved or not. This would be a way, if you wanted to pay for something like that, would, again, I'm not suggesting that this is how you do it, but this is a way to think about how to get the income to pay for something like that. So now the question becomes, well, how do you get that 30 grand? All right, well, let's say, for the sake of argument, we want that $30,000 in one year. We want to save that up in, uh, for one year. So in one year, uh, let's see here, in a year, you have 12 months. So that means we take 30,000 and we divide that by 12. That means we need $2,500 per month. All right. Now, let's say we're making an income. Our income is, say, $6,000. I'm being kind of generous on this one, but just to show the idea. $6,000 per month. We subtract off this $2,500, pay ourselves first, all right? And from there, we get the 3,500, just wanna make sure, we get 35 remaining. This is what takes care of all of the household expenses. It takes care of all your discretionary, mandatory expenses, everything. You're living off of this now. So you get $6,000 cash coming in, 2,500 goes into this asset accumulation this, for, this, for this right here, and you live off of the remaining $3,500. Let's throw this out there. Um, as of right now, which is 2019, a full Roth is $6,000 divided by 12, that's $500 a month. Let's go ahead and let's take this $3,500 and let's take off $500. And that's gonna go to a Roth IRA just because we are good financial people like that who budget, by the way. So now we are down to $3,000 to live on. This becomes, oh, per month. This is now the monthly expenses that we have to live on. So now what's, so, so here's what's happened. We are now setting aside of our $6,000 monthly income. We are now setting aside $2,500 per month to go towards an asset that will grow to $30,000. Once it hits that $30,000, it will spit out around 4% of dividends every year, which will be about $100 a month. All the while, we're fully funding a Roth and we're living off of the remaining balance. This would then break down into your housing, your food, your bills, whatever else. And this breaks down you know, further and further and further. Okay, oh, and your sinking funds, of course. Don't forget those. Sinking funds, SFs. This would break down into all of these different little categories. And here's what's gonna happen after a year. Here's the final result. At the end of that year, you will have a fully funded Roth, $30,000, which by the way, has increased A, by a plus 30K, 
which increased net work by a plus 30K. You also increased your Roth by an additional 6K. That's from the Roth. So that goes up by an extra 6K. So overall, net worth has grown by $36,000 in just this one year alone. And then, starting next year, you will have this $30,000 asset spitting out dividends that you can now use to spend on whatever you want, whether it's coffee, whether it's games, whether it's just whatever it is that you want, minus taxes and everything, of course. But this strategy right here, where you use an asset to buy these things, the, all those tiny little things that, they were that they're talking about in the video, that right there is a much better strategy than using money that you're, that's coming in from your job. And unfortunately, I'm willing to bet that all those people that they interviewed in that video do not do stuff like this. Over $100 a month on ride share services. Sometimes I go over my budget. Let's have a savings account for, you know, to kind of make up for it. Finance experts agree that budgets are just plain unrealistic. What experts? At the end of the month, you look back, you feel horrible, you feel guilty, you realize you overspent. And then what do you do? You say, screw this, I'm not going to do this anymore. No, that's not what they do. Oh, that's a bad shot. That's not what people do. Um, what people usually end up doing is they find out just how poor their spending habits were in the past, and the budget puts things back on track. I've, I, I've worked with people with this. And it, it is humbling to see just how bad you've been at it, when you, if, especially if you've never done a budget before. But it's also very eye-opening and enlightening to go, okay, now I see the path forward. Now I see what I have to do now. I, I now see what I need to start allocating for different expenses and how to make things work so I can work towards the goal that I set at the beginning. They're not fun at all. It's like having a diet. So even when you go on them, often you fall right off within two to three months. Ah, no. Okay. This idea that you should do something or not do something just simply because it's fun. Okay. I, there are certain things in life where the fun factor is a good metric with which to use and make your decision. If you're going to Disneyland and you want to, you're looking at all the different rides, yeah, here's the fun factor. Which one do you think you want to go on? Which are you going to have the most fun? Sure. If you're at Six Flags and you happen to see there's a ride that goes up and down and up and all around and all over the place and it's spinning around and this, and you just happen to have a giant big bowl of nachos with extra onions and jalapenos, and you decide, you know what, I'm not really in the mood for tasting that again, nor wearing it, so I'm going to go ahead and sit this one out. Again, another example of using the fun factor as a way of determining your involvement in certain activities. But there are other things that it just doesn't work with. Going to the doctors is not fun. Getting a blood test and having, you know, being poked with a, with a needle is not fun, especially if you have a fear of needles. Going to the dentist for a cleaning is not fun. But we do these things because it's for the overall betterment of our health and well-being. Just like a budget may not be fun for a lot of people, but we do them because it works out for the betterment of our financial well-being. So to say that, oh, well, we, it's, it's not fun is a terrible metric to evaluate whether or not we should or shouldn't be doing this thing. Just keep housing, transportation, and food as low as possible, and then go out to that basketball game. Go grab beers with your friends. Go get that manicure, pedicure. Because okay. First of all, in order for you to reduce housing, transportation, and, um, and food, you have to know how much to do that. That requires budgeting of skills. And as far as the other stuff is concerned, I don't... What you always do in a budget is you always leave a certain amount of what I call blow money. It's just money that you do for, for whatever. And when people do, when they set aside a certain amount of this, you know, they can call it personal, blow, fun money, entertainment, whatever it is you want to call it, that's what gives people the, the permission to not feel guilty. And they don't feel guilty about spending it. Some folks might save it for the next month. Other folks might spend it. It's totally up to them. It is guilt-free money. But the thing is, and the point of it is, by budgeting for it and having a certain amount every single month that you get to just blow on whatever it is you want, 
you can spend it and you know you're not breaking your budget, you're not overspending, and you're still moving towards your goal while also still having the same fun that he's talking about. I agree you should still have the fun and you should still enjoy yourself, but just budget for it. Okay, yes, this is what I do. I've already set up automatic contributions to my savings accounts, investments, and vacation fund. And by tracking my expenses from big ones like rent to small ones like coffee, I know exactly where my money is going and I'm less likely to overspend. Setting a dollar amount on things like groceries just isn't gonna work for me. Okay, did you just hear that? Like, that's exactly what a budget is. That's a budget. That's a budget. Okay, and not only that, did you just hear her where she said that she, tr uh, where she tracks her spending to make sure that she doesn't overspend? But then the next sentence that came out of her mouth was, but using a specific dollar amount doesn't work. Those two ideas are in conflict. You, in order for you to know if you're overspending, you have to set a dollar amount on certain categories. How do you know that you've overspent if you don't know where the line is? That, that completely contradicts what she just said. I, no, that, no, it doesn't work. She's doing a budget, okay? She's just maybe not referring to it as a budget because I guess the word budget for some reason has these negative connotations of it. And again, this goes back to my original point. This video is describing budgets as being, they're not fun, they're, un, they're, they're boring, they're dis, uh, they, they make you feel guilty, they make you feel bad about spending. The reason why uh, that this is the case and what I've observed, and because I know this because it happened to me, is these folks that are doing a budget like this do not have a goal. There's no financial goal that they're working towards. There's no uh, light at the end of the tunnel that they can see that's motivating them. It's like I said on my, uh, my student loan video, I'll post a link up here for that. In that video, I, was, I had no problem sticking to my budget and I looked forward to doing it because I wanted to be debt free more than anything in the world. That's what I wanted. That was my main number one focus and I was willing to do whatever it took to reach that. But here's the thing. If I didn't want that goal, the odds of me sticking to that budget of, oh, okay, I'll go ahead and drop my food budget down to 120 bucks a month. I would not have stuck with that. There's no way. I would have gone to McDonald's and Taco Bell more often than I would have and more than I should have. But because I knew I could see the but I could see what the plan was. I could see what the numbers were and what they were leading to. I could make that decision much easier to go like, no, I'm not going to spend extra on this. I'm not going to do this. Budgeting is absolutely necessary. This is and it's not a waste of time. It's absolutely important. And the best part is I never feel guilty spending money. Yeah, neither do I and neither does a lot of other people because they set aside a certain amount for blow or entertainment every single budget. Mm. And you shouldn't either. I always feel guilty spending money. I feel guilty spending money just because you want to be saving for your future, but you never know what's going to happen, so I guess you have to enjoy it while you can. That is such an immature, bullshit, adolescent lack of insight. To say that, well, I, you know, YOLO, you know, you only live once, I might as well go ahead and spend the money uh, now because I don't know if I'm going to have it tomorrow. Th that is such an immature excuse to not be responsible and do a budget. That's really all that that is. I don't agree with that at all. Um, most likely you are going to live into the future, well into the future. And you ask anybody who currently right now doesn't have retirement savings and they are scheduled to retire in about a five, 10 years, which is what I noticed on some of the FPU classes that I've taken. And it's very scary. It's very scary when you don't have enough, when you have maybe 20, 30 grand saved up total and you only have a few working years left. That is the scary part. And budgeting is the cornerstone of what could have prevented a situation like that. Spend wisely, don't spend incorrectly, take care of your priorities first. Here's what you need to remember. Don't bother budgeting. Do keep track of your spending. Set up automatic savings, and then spend without guilt. I'd have never believed in um, denying yourself little pleasures, because um, I know lots of people who uh, go to the grave with um, vast fortunes, and um, you certainly can't spend it there. Well, yeah, you certainly can't spend it there, but the, the issue is you can have the small 
pleasures in life. There's nothing wrong with that. You, but a budget can also help you do that. In fact, a budget is gonna alleviate any kind of guilt or bad feelings that you might have, which I don't understand how you would have had those anyway. Uh, the bad feelings happen when you come to reality face to face with your poor spending habits. So anyways, uh, thanks for listening to me rant for a little bit there. I hope uh, that you uh, uh, enjoyed that. And if so, please go ahead and give me a little thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more content like this, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And I will talk with you guys later. Have a good one. Bye-bye.